No, no, I, 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 I think that, so I think we're likely one place to state, but I mean, it sounded, so the, what Chris Hadley was saying in terms of the fact that you need to rely on hyperons and how they interact at a few times with the saturation density means that there is at least theoretically enough freedom in how you specify how the hyperons interact with each other and nuclei. You can imagine that that interaction would be quite repulsive and very high density without affecting the high nuclei, in which case you could survive the but for the Stefanos, and, you know, yeah. in a microscope you know, approach, you would explain that by saying the three body interaction is repulsive, and you're already sensitive to it at three hypernuclei. And if you can do the calculation well enough to see that sensitivity, then you will know what's happening at higher densities. But let me But so you're saying that if they detect three point five. Star, that would still not rule out hyper hyperonic because you could, because you can you have this freedom of unknown or this unknown. So you would if they discovered a very massive neutron star, it would imply that the hyperon repulsion is significant. That yes, we now understand why hyperons don't appear. And that's that's all. Can, is it not possible to have lower mass stars that host hyperons and higher mass stars? No. Can that be phenomenal? Not possible because higher mass stars achieve higher core densities. So you would, if they're in the lighter stars, they're certainly they're in larger numbers in the hot. Oh, you mean once you put them there, you can't? Yeah, if you make it bigger, you get more hyperons, more mass. So if you actually wanted to kill hyperons, would, it, would a definite 11 kilometer radius neutron star do it? Would that be a stronger constraint? Yeah, I think, I think a small radii would uh, imply, uh, you know, uh, it, it will be difficult to get. Uh, yeah, I think, I think probably 2.4 solar mass for myself, it, it will almost kill anything like, you know, hyperons because it's. Yeah, 2.4 will imply that you have just nucleonic matter. I, my yeah, feeling is. Not all the nuclear Hamiltonians support 2.4. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. So there are yeah, serious troubles even yeah. for nuclear models for getting hyperons. Yeah, but they do better. But they, they do better <laughs> than. <laughs> Accept about quark matter, it's possible to put hyperons in, have your radius be 11 kilometers, and then have a sufficiently, you know, finely tuned quark matter equation of state that give you 2.4 solar mass neutron star. I don't know, but it, there's, it's, it's possible there's something like that that you could do. It would be very finely tuned, but not necessarily possible. You know, um, I, I think what, what I, I, I showed today is still sane. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite, quite reasonable to me. You know, if I just look, I say, okay, this, this looks reasonable. If there is a 2.4 solar mass star, I don't know what unreasonable thing I have to do to get there. I mean, unless I throw away all the hyperons, then I have no problem. This model produces 2.4 solar mass without hyperons. So. Okay, quark matter. Um, so again, uh, let me start with the Lagrangian. We, ha we use the Lagrangian, which is uh, NGL Lagrangian. So I, I, I won't describe this in, in very detail. Um, uh, so it has a scalar coupling among quarks, and uh, there is so-called dequark coupling, which produces uh, color superconductivity. There is some six-quark term. And the new, new term here is actually, which deviates from the standard NGL model, is this one, which includes the vector interactions. And these are absolutely necessary to get heavy massive uh, stars, because these vector interactions are repulsive in, are, uh, repulsive in quark matter, and they uh, produce um, um, stiffer equation of state. Okay, so uh, pairing. 
There are two, two, two types of pairing uh, are considered. One is uh, so-called um, 2SC phase, where only two colors and two flavors are paired. And uh, this is this one. And there is also a CFL phase for where all the phases are, uh, all the colors and flavors are, are paired. Just remember that this, this phase appears at low densities relatively, and this phase appears at uh, large densities. Um, and here we go. So we have an uh, equation of state here uh, where uh, we have first nucleonic phase, then there is a first order phase transition to, to a C phase, and then you have a sec second first order transition to the CFL phase. In this game, we have two parameters. One parameter is vector coupling uh, divided by scalar coupling. Scalar coupling is pretty standard in NGL models, so you can measure vector coupling in terms of the scalar coupling. It's zero here, you see, and uh, 0.6 here. So basically, vector coupling is almost equal to scalar coupling. And what you see that the equation of state becomes stiffer because vector interactions are uh, repulsive and they're stiff and the equation of state. Also, the sharp first order phase transitions seen here are smeared out by repulsive interactions. The second parameter is the transition from uh, nucleonic matter to the quark matter, which we vary from between 2.5 uh, saturation density to four times uh, saturation density. Then we looked at the stars. This is just a uh, <coughs> Uh, heavy mass uh, limit of mass radius relationship for uh, these equations of state. And what we, uh, this is this uh, 1.97 uh, solar mass limit. And we see that only for strong vector interactions, 0.6, we obtain massive neutron stars. For lower values, we obtain, uh, we, we, we do not uh, get uh, to this limit. So you, this. Are you free to play with the vector? Well, there is there are there are ideas like naturalness, which means that uh, you know the coupling constant must be of order of one once you set a scale. So the scale is set by the scalar coupling. So you would say, okay, it, it should be of order of one. You know this ratio. It couldn't be hundred or two hundred or thousand. So you can't push it well, to. I'm just Yeah, of order of one, as I said. Okay, this is this is by the way this is the nucleonic equation of state here. So you choose the transition density, uh, and every time you change the vector coupling, mm -hmm. you readjust some of the other couplings so that the transition still occurs at the same density. So this is this is the answer to your question. <laughs> this is the uh, plot. Uh, where one parameter is transition density and the other parameter is vector coupling. Mm -hmm. And uh, what you see is um, that, um, let's see, let me uh, see. So um, uh, to, the, to the right of these red curves, you have stars which have already CFL cores, okay? Below this green line, you have 2SC stars. Everything below in this parameter space, below this green line, you have 2SC uh, stars. Uh, these numbers label the radius of CFL core inside the stars. And here we go. Here, here is your 1.97 mass uh, star, this blue line. So these are constant mass stars. So you can start at this, at zero, you know, so you get what you get. If you have transition here to quark matter and zero coupling, you will get to uh, nine, two solar masses. And th if you move along this line or go above this line, you always get those stars. If not, then not. Okay? So for large vector couplings, you can reduce the you can reduce the transition density. This, this blue line tells, tells us this, this one. Okay. So this much about, uh, you know, massive neutron, um, neutron stars with quark matter. 
So if you have uh, the lessons we learned is that uh, if you add vector interactions which are of natural size, then you can obtain massive neutron stars within the specific uh, quark matter equation of state model, which is NGL model. Some people use more simpler models like MIT model, or you can use, say, dyson schwinger model, which is a bit more sophisticated. It depends on the taste. Okay, now uh, the next topic, uh, let me try to finish with this, is the cooling of uh, quark stars. So the major, uh, the most important cooling agent uh, in a neutron star is the Urca process, the decay of D quark into U electron plus antineutrino, and the inverse reaction where you capture electron on U quark, produce a D quark and a neutrino. And to compute the emissivity, we need a polarization tensor, uh, uh, <coughs> which is uh, which is multiplied, which is contracted with the leptonic trace. This lambda is very simple stuff. It's leptonic trace, but the difficult part is the polarization tensor, which is given by these Feynman diagrams. And analytically, you can write it in this way, where you have these propagators of quarks, and these are given here: normal propagator, anomalous propagator. So. You can plug in them here and compute the polarization tensor, and then you contract with the lepton trace, and then you obtain your emissivity. So here I plot the emissivity normalized to the emissivity in non-superconducting uh, matter. Okay, In non-superconducting matter, the Urca process computed by Iwamoto in the 80s is well known. So this would be one. And now uh, this is the emissivity in the two flavor to a C phase. And there is one parameter in this game, which is here denoted by zeta. It's the ratio of delta, the gap, over the shift between the Fermi surfaces of U and D quarks. Because of beta equilibrium, the Fermi surfaces are shifted. So you see when delta, uh, so uh, when uh, this zeta is larger than one, which means that the delta, the gap is larger than the shift between chemical potentials, your entire Fermi sphere is gapped. As a consequence, what you see is that uh, the emissivity is suppressed here at low temperatures. Here, temperature drops from here to here. At low temperatures, it, it's suppressed uh, exponentially. If uh, zeta is smaller than 1, which means that the gap is smaller than the difference between the chemical potentials. In that case, you have uh, portions of Fermi sphere which is ungapped. In that case, we obtain emissivity which is of order of 1. That means uh, the system emits as if it was um, superconducting, uh, non-superconducting. Now, uh, let me turn to the idea of Cas A. If you look at the phase diagram of uh, quark matter using this the same NGL model, in the temperature and asymmetry between the U and D quarks, the phase di diagram looks like this. In the high temperature, low asymmetry case, you have 2SC phase. But if you go to large asymmetries and low temperature, then you obtain some sort of crystalline phase. And it turns out that the 2SC phase has this, this property, that its uh, emissivity is like this. And the crystalline phase has the property that its emissivity is like this. Now, the conjecture is that uh, your star is born at, with high temperatures and low asymmetries. We know a uh, star is born in supernova explosion. It's almost symmetric matter. And then it cools rapidly through this phase. And eventually, through beta processes, uh, it settles at high asymmetry and low temperatures. So this is the case in the beta equilibrium. Here is the temperature, but now the density. You see, if we, for a given density, we just move from here to here. We first, from unpaired quark matter, we enter into 2SC phase and then the crystalline phase. So now this idea is implemented here in the cooling simulation of a star, which has a quark core and uh, hadronic envelope. And uh, uh, let me take this curve here. Uh, well, here we have a 2SC phase. Basically, the star cools with 2SC phase. Suddenly, uh, it enters the uh, crystalline phase. It uh, 
emissivity changes abruptly from being exponentially suppressed to uh, order of one and it drops down and then eventually the quark processes become unimportant and the star cools further down. So this generic behavior you obtain from different parameters. What, is, what are the parameters? One, one parameter is the temperature which I am varying here. The temperature of phase transition between 2SC and uh, crystalline phase. There is another pr parameter which defines the width, the time scale over which this transition occurs. In what units are those temperatures? Uh, these are in temperature, in units of MeV, I think. Uh, yeah, there, there is one, one zero probably. No, no, this is right, this is right. Okay. Yeah, if, if you have early, uh, large temperature, this occurs early, and if you have low temperature, this occurs here. And this is, this is where cos A is sitting. And here now we go from logarithmic scale to the linear scale. And this is the data from Vin and colleagues. And here you see that by fine-tuning this one parameter, I can uh, push the curves through this data. What is the um, mass and radius of this? So the, uh, these are very massive stars. These are uh, something like two solar mass. I think this, this one, this particular model is 1.91 solar mass star. Radius? radius is something like 13 kilometers. Okay, so this is this is all I wanted to say about cos A. We can stop, or there is there is a small uh, section on rotational induced, uh, but we can skip that. Why don't you stop here? And, uh, okay. Thank, uh, yeah. Armin. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, so uh, hyperons are not yet in excluded by by uh, the observations, but I think if a um, 2.4 solar mass neutron star will uh, probably exclude, in my <coughs> opinion. Yeah. So combined hypernuclear data and and uh, you know observational data can uh, constrain couplings in any density functional. In and we showed that on our example that you can really do that. That's interesting. Cos A behavior can be understood as a phase transition within QCD phase diagram from one superfluid phase to another superfluid phase just uh, by changing the uh, adjusting the critical temperature of transition. And this, I didn't talk about this, but uh, by decelerating or spinning up a star, you can induce a transition to superconducting quark matter. Any questions? Um, so, with regard to the Lagrangian, uh, so in principle, you could uh, take out the meson flip completely in the spirit of the point coupling models and just replace all the meson self-interactions with density dependences in the, in the coupling constants, right? That's possible, yeah. And so have, I'm just, just out of curiosity, have you tried to do that within this parameterization, or does that mean that the parameterization of the couplings that you would have needs to be more complicated? Um, well, I have, uh, you know, we don't do this fitting to the chart of nuclei. That's, that's yeah, the problem. That's so that's we, we are exporting from other groups. So anything that is related to changing the parameters, it's always, uh, for us, it's, I mean, yeah. it's possible, but we have to ask other people. Another thing, uh, point coupling uh, models were found uh, in a survey of, large survey of uh, many models, about 100 models, relativistic mean, photo mean field models. They found that coupling, point coupling models are not good enough. Oh, is this Survey paper by the Brazil and the Dutra and well, yeah, Providencia yeah, and yeah, others. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No further questions. I suggest we get the uh, coffee and cookies. Mm. And we can actually use the discussion room there.